Welcome everyone. Quite impressed with the size of the room. <laughs> so bear with me, a bit of uh, adrenaline. Um, so I'm Julien, Julien Peloton. I'm a research engineer at CNRS, one of the research institutes in France. This is a picture of an observatory, a real one. So it's located in Chile. It's called the Rabin Observatory. And with Fabrice, who is on stage, who will join me on stage later, and Etienne here in this room, I'll try to give you some idea of what we are doing uh, here. Okay, so Think, Think is the name of the project. Uh, it, it, makes, it mixes astronomy and computing. But ex what exactly are we doing? So we track changes in the sky. And how we do that? So imagine you own the observatory I showed you before. You take a picture of the sky. You come back the day after, and you take a picture of the same sky at the same position. You make the difference, and then you wonder what has changed. And you would be surprised. A lot of things change at every time scale. Second, minutes, hours, day, months. And that can be obvious things like asteroids, comets, uh, that, are, that are passing by. That can be less obvious things, death of a star, for example, something explode in the sky, and that can be very quick. Like in a matter of minutes, imagine a star just ripped off and nothing left. So we have to be very quick, often, just to make sure that we can get information and, and understand what happened. The problem is if you have uh, a telescope that is very uh, powerful, so very deep, that goes very deep, uh, and that can scan every little detail, you will get many of those events, of those changes that we call alerts. Typically, millions per night, millions even. And so you cannot just get them and look them by eyes. That would be just impossible. Even if you have an army of PhD students, uh, you don't get enough. So you need to, 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 make automate, to automate all of that. And here comes Think. So Think is a broker, so it's a software, uh, that is basically serving the community by ingesting those stream of alerts that are coming in real time. Try to classify the events, because the events, when, when they come, they are pure information in a pure sense. They don't contain any scientific information. It's just position, a change, like a delta in, in luminosity, and a time, nothing else. So we try to classify that, and I will give you some details how we do that. We filter them, because over the several millions, maybe a few only if, if is of interest for you, and we redistribute that. This is what we do, basically. How we do that? So all our services are deployed on academic clouds, large cloud that we operate. We operate 24-7, except when they are clouds, the real one on the sky. Uh, we cannot deal with that. And we are serving more than 100, uh, let's say, users. And by users, I mean that can be a human, a scientist. Uh, that can be an observatory that wants to perform other observation of what you found what you have found, or that can be amateurs. So you, with your telescope in your backyard, and want to observe something, just, you can just connect to Think, and you will, we will give you what's interesting uh, at your position. And for that, we have uh, so this pipeline that you can see on the right. So the alert, they, they flow from, from the bottom. So we collect everything from various observatories. It's a real-time component, and we produce alerts via Kafka. And all of that is sent to uh, Apache Spark clusters, where uh, basically the computation is performed. And here you have a lot of machine learning, for example, algorithm, that based on this small subset of information that we have, try to infer the nature of the physical process that is taking place. And we have to do that in real time, uh, because they, then the users don't want to miss the event of the year. And then you have to exit of pink, either the, the real-time component, so on the left for you, uh, where people basically can subscribe um, using various means. That can be a Slack channel, that can be Telegram, that can be Kafka, that can be name it. Uh, so the, 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 the idea is to make it simple so that when there, when there is something, they can receive a notification. And we archive everything as well. So those 10 millions a night, over many years, we have to store them on disk to make sure that it can be accessed later on. 
And so we have an event database of about 1 billion entries. And for that, we use uh, Apache Edge Base uh, distributed, uh, basically, database. The nice thing about Fink is <clears throat> I don't know anything about asteroids. I don't know anything about supernovae. I'm just a simple engineer. So how can I actually do classification if I don't know the physics behind? So this part uh, in, 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 the, in the classification basically is community driven. So the users, they will come and they will bring the building bricks to the project, what we call the science module. So things where there is the physics actually. So, hey, if I have this information, this information, that probably means this is an asteroid or this is a supernova. So we outsource basically this classification to the community. And if you think about that, it's as if you were asking your users or customers to basically change the source code of your application to get a tailored experience. And you, you know what? It works. It works very well. We have dozens of contributors. They come, they see the point, they modify things, and then they get, they get exactly what they want at the end of Think. Because I cannot do that for them. But there is a question. There is the question that everybody should ask every day, and that we ask ourselves every day, is when this will break, okay? Uh, when and where? Where are the failure points in that diagram here? It's, it's nice, it works, it does what it's supposed to do, but will it do it forever? Of course, the difficulty is really the long run. It's easy to make quick and dirty things. Uh, it's, it's way more challenging uh, to keep it running for years. And in think we are set up for basically the next decade. Telescope will still observe, and we have to serve the community. First, <clears throat> the number of maintainers is, is really low. OK, we are not many. We are university, not many money. <laughs> if you want to invest, we, we are nice. Um, but we are not many, OK? Um, so deployment and operations really should be made easy. I don't want to struggle on production. So go on, we don't observe all the time. I mean, telescopes don't observe all the time. They're shut down, they're clouds, there are a lot of things. So the throughput, the, the rate of alert that is coming, it ranges from zero to million. So we want to have the capability to auto-scale. We don't want to deploy the whole infrastructure if there is nothing. It's just a waste of power, electricity, and, and, and machine. As I said, we outsource everything to the expert, to the domain expert, and they are really crucial agents for the scientific discoveries. Okay, they, they know where to look, basically. The problem is they usually have very low computer skills. So when you tell them, yes, you can modify the code, they just don't know where to start. And if, if, if they provide something, it's just not usable most of the time. Um, so you should provide with them high-level abstractions, definitely. Don't assume they will just know all the details that you know as a software engineer. They don't. And they don't want to know. It's not their job. Also, they come with their code, and often they have requirements, dependencies. Oh, I want to use PyTorch, TensorFlow, Keras, name it. I mean, all those huge, huge beasts uh, that are first huge, <laughs> make big image, uh, but also often incompatible between one project to another. And so we really have to think about microservices, not like monolithic things that just will break at some point because you are trying to put everything within the same thing. As well, there is, and I think it's, 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 the transition is sort of started a few years ago. Before, there was an infrastructure. It was there physically, and the user had to know how works the infrastructure. Okay, they had to adapt to this infrastructure. This is no more the case. I think we really are in a moment where is this the order around, where the infrastructure should adapt to specific user needs. Okay, we are flexible enough. We know how to do different things. They are heterogeneous architecture. CPU, GPU, cloud, HPC machine, etc. So we should provide with them this luxury of choosing uh, depending on what they need. Another th last thing, we often test the code, but in our case, the platform, the, 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 the infrastructure uh, is part of all the, the thing. I mean, there is the deployment, uh, it's highly heterogeneous, there are many of those clusters, and should be tested as well. And so end-to-end -end testing is necessary, including code and infrastructure. And when you see this list, it's clearly a node, a node 
ODE uh, to Kubernetes. I mean, when we, when we saw that, we said, okay, probably we, we should try. We should, we should give a try to Kubernetes and try to see if it can, if it can help. And now I will leave the stage to Fabrice that will tell you all the details uh, of implementation. Thank you so much, Julien. Mm -hmm. So now I will explain how we leverage Kubernetes to scale the Fink broker. So the goal is not only to scale the Fink broker on cloud native technology, the goal is to understand how to use cloud native Kubernetes technology and Kubernetes and cloud in the academic on premise platform. So what we learn with, Kuban with Fink, we'll use it also for other academic projects. For example, now we provide on-demand Kubernetes cluster, on-demand Apache Spark cluster on our OpenStack platforms. <laughs> we also pro provide on-demand self-hosted GitHub Action Runner to academic community. And we run a lot of training on cloud technologies for students and staff. So we want to embed the whole academic community toward cloud native technology. So now I will introduce how we run a scalable self-hosted CI. Because as Julia explained, Think Broker is a ton of uh, data mining, data learning, um, machine learning algorithm you have to run. And it's difficult to test in CI. So here is the GitHub uh, action dashboard. And you see, at each commit, each time a developer commits to the ThinkBroker code, we run the whole stack. We replicate the production platform at each commit, okay? And so we are sure the code always works. So if you want to see the detail, look, at each commit, on the, Git, on the runner, we install a Kubernetes cluster, we install Operator LifeCycle Manager, we install the Argo CD operator, then we install Kafka, Manio, S2 storage. We, uh, um, we run some alert, we simulate alert from telescope, and then we run the Think Broker to analyze the data with machine learning algorithm. Okay? So you see, this is a huge stack and complex stack, and we need to be sure it works at all time. Okay? So in order to do this, with open source tool, which is named KTest Toolbox. And you see KTest Toolbox, you can see on the bottom right, in four lines, you can install Kind with Kubernetes. You run KTBX Create. Then you can install OLM, Operator LifeCycle Manager, then Argo CD, then Argo Workflow. So you have a cluster, to Kubernetes cluster, up and running in four lines, where you can bootstrap and run your application. Okay? Very easy. And then you can trigger the GitOps procedure with Argo workflow to install StreamZ, Kafka operator, which works very well, and to install Kafka and Minio. Okay? So then we have all thing dependencies which are up and running in the cluster in a few lines of shell. Okay? All you have to do is wait for the container to come uh, on the cluster. Okay? You have to wait for the container to download. Then for uh, Spark, it's a bit more complex because the Spark um, startup script is a shell script, very complex shell script with plenty of options. And as you know, this is not a declarative way of installing application. This is imperative way. So this does not work with GitOps. So what we have done is we have written a, vri um, a wrapper on top of Spark submit with a configuration file to ease the launch of this uh, complex uh, shell script, okay? So this is better than having the pure shell script, of course, but we are not uh, yet GitOps, so we are um, investigating the Spark operator, which is not uh, the official Spark install procedure, but, but will allow us to be more GitOps and deploy Spark with Argo CD, okay? It's a bit difficult to run uh, Spark, it's batch. It's a bit uh, difficult to run batch on um, GitOps, you see. But the operator provides uh, 
technique for, in order to do that. Well, also CIOX, CIOX is a very lightweight tool, which is uh, uh, a lot of CI and also our deployment in production, because you see with CIOX, with some time in your repository, you don't change the source code. You change the integration trace procedure, you change the test data, but not the source code. So what's inside the image will not change. And you have to wait for the image to rebuild, even if nothing has changed. And uh, so Stux will avoid that. Stux has a Git API, and it will check if, your, if some part of your code has changed. If no code has changed, it will retrieve a previous image with the same code. So the CI build process will run in a few seconds. And then you can go to the CI step, which runs the end-to-end -end test, okay? So for the end-to-end -end test, SUX is also very important because you see we have different projects. We have the main project, but we have also other projects in other repository in development. We have our microservice based, and we have to, ins to install a, co a consistent stack of the version of all our microservices. And stack, uh, SUX, it will, you see, track all the version for all your microservices. And so you know what you have run during your CI for all your microservices. And it will get the source code, build, build them, and also get some image, Docker image, if you need Docker image, and install some other product. So you see, in one line, you can install all your dependencies for your microservices which are under development. And you can track it. And you can log it in your CI. You know what you have built, so you know what you will deploy in production. So um, what is also very important, it's a self-hosted runner, because you see, think, it requires lots of disk, lots of memory, even to run on end-to-end -end test. And so the self-hosted, we can't run it on a GitHub Action runner, it does not scale. So the self-hosted runner, it's very important to scale and to be able to run, think with all the science algorithm. So self-hosted runner, it runs on a Kubernetes cluster, Okay, which is inside our OpenStack platform. And then it's based on ARC, which works well now. And each time you could do a commit in GitHub, it will start a pod. And the, your script, your CI script, will run inside the pod, okay? And we will install uh, Kine, Kubernetes, OLM, all we have seen previously inside the pod, okay? So this is not so much um, optimized now because we run Kind inside the pod. So we run Kubernetes inside the pod. So we have investigating the cluster to create virtual cluster instead of having kind inside the pod to be more optimized. But it works, eh? But we are, we are improving it. And um, also, um, it's powerful, the CI process, but you see, you reinstall the production platform each time you do a commit. And it's, it's a, you have to maintain it. It means, okay, you have lots of problems with the CI because it does a lot of stuff. And so you are maintaining the CI to work with up-to-date version of your code. So you, honestly, you spend a lot of time waiting for the CI to install everything, and then you debug, okay? The good thing is that you don't have to debug on environment platform that you set up from scratch. It times, each time there is a bug. And the good, time, the good thing is that also when you deploy in production, you push a button and it works. So the time you spend on the CI, you don't spend it in production. Because in production, it's easy to set up production once you have set up your end-to-end -end test in CI. So you see the self-hosted runner, it brings us scalability. So we can have plenty of resources for running a CI at scale. And also we have interactive debugging, which is very interesting, because you see, you spend maybe two hours or three hours to install the production platform, or to install a development version of Think on a, of a, new, on a new Kubernetes cluster. Here, all you have to do is wait, and if you have an error in your CI, you run two lines, you see, you get the kubeconfig, you connect to the CI cluster, okay, in two lines, and you are in your uh, environment, the Think environment with all the microservices which are running. And here, for example, you see, in two lines, I connect to the CI and I see there is an error on my pod. Okay? If I do not have this interactive access, I have to reproduce all of this on a virtual machine and it will spend uh, maybe two or three hours to have some, if I do not do mistake. So this is great for debugging, very easy. And then, you see, I can watch the log from my pod. Okay, there is an error uh, in the Python code or in the Python code dependency management here, and so I can fix it, okay? 
So you, what you do now, when you debug, you push a button, you wait, you log, and, but you don't have to restyle everything, okay? The CI will do all of this for you in a deterministic way. This is powerful. And so with GitHub Action Runner, you can't do that because it does not scale and you have interactive access, you can act to have interactive access, but it's not so great, it's not so great. So this is uh, very interesting for CI, self-hosted runner. So as a conclusion, I would say that Fink need to run until 2035. So we need to use stable technologies, okay? So we are very careful with the Kubernetes ecosystem and we try to stick with graduated projects, not to have to, some, to, to, to put too much energy on a project that will disappear before the end of the maintenance. We have, we'll expect hundreds of users watching the sky. Okay, so people uh, all over the world will uh, embed their algorithm inside Think. So it's an exciting challenge. Kubernetes development, there is still a lot of work, but we have something which, which work uh, on our integration platform and in the CI. So we have something which work we need to improve. And uh, it's a great opportunity to learn uh, better how to operate academic on-premise cloud. So we want to use uh, on-premise uh, infrastructure, okay? And it's great because even if you have some maintenance at all the level, you understand pretty well what's happening. So it's a great challenge. Thank you so much for your attention and feel free to ask uh, any question. Hi. Hi. Uh, quick question. You already mentioned that you were planning on sharing uh, Think with the scientific community. Um, are you also planning on uh, extending your current uh, cluster to allow other uh, telescopes to add their events to your cluster? Kind of working towards one big system that allows you to combine all the, the, the astronom astronomical events uh, making it easier to combine data, whatever. That's a good question, yes. So, <clears throat> yeah, we try to bring as many observatories, telescope surveys as we can. Uh, however, I think it's, it's not... <clears throat> having a single system for everything is definitely not what we want to have for many reasons. Uh, the first reason is, is mostly sociological. Uh, having one system with one team uh, is less flexible than having multiple teams. And there are other brokers than Fink, for example, that are doing, I wouldn't say the same thing because they do it worst, um, <laughs> but they are, they are doing similar things. And it's probably great for the diversity uh, because, well, we are limiting manpower as well. So if there are other teams uh, doing orthogonal things, it's good. Uh, but yes, definitely the idea is, in, is still to converge and having as many things as possible because what you do as a scientist probably will benefit another scientist. So imagine, for example, I am tracking gamma ray bursts, though they are like very quick explosion in the sky. Uh, they can be easily mimicked by something else that just flashes, like an asteroid or um, some other thing. So if someone is working on my contaminants, on asteroids, etc., and they can name it, me, I don't have to think about those things because they will be named and removed by someone else. So yes, having more teams is definitely uh, a, a good thing. Uh, one plus one is more than two in that case. Yeah. I have a question over here. I, yeah. hey. um, first, first of all, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I think it was the best one I've seen so far, like real problems and real challenges. Thank you. Um, I have a question more about the organizational structure. Like, how was your team created? How was it funded? And what kind of organizational challenges do you have? Because I think you have very limited funding and you need to work around this and still scale all this stuff up. Thanks for, for the question. May I? Yeah. So <clears throat> the project was created in 2019 uh, after the observatory that I showed you at the beginning issued a call uh, a call. So they had this data volume problem. They knew they had to, to send like several terabytes every night, uh, millions of alerts, and they didn't know how to do it. So they issue a call. 
And while at university, there are research labs that are doing R&D and we're working on, on similar problems, so doing streaming at scale with Spark. So we say, hey, that's a good use case, actually. Uh, so we started contacting scientists uh, to explain them that we had, a, we had a solution to their problem and let's partner together. That was the first thing. Then we had to find, to find fundings for that. And there you need to convince, basically, um, funding agency in research, uh, that's challenging. <laughs> they don't have a lot, uh, but still there is some money, uh, I, I won't lie. Uh, so currently we are funded until 2035 in terms of hardware. So that's, to give you an idea, that's a million euro for thing, for example, in terms of hardware, including all the cloud infrastructure I showed you, um, the replacement of the, of the, of the hardware, etc., for the next 10 years. And now we need people. <laughs> Do you want to join us? <laughs> That's difficult. That's difficult to attract because while we do a lot of teaching at university, so we can still brainwash students and tell them that we are better and they should stay with us. But uh, well, clearly uh, it's highly competitive. So whenever they learn about Kubernetes, Spark, Kafka, uh, they are attractive on the market. So that's difficult to, 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 to let them, uh, well, it's difficult to, to, to ask them to stay. And yeah, there is a huge turnover at this, uh, this point. Okay, Yeah. thank you. Yes, I had another small question. Uh, in the beginning, you showed the processing pipeline uh, from data to event alert, and I was wondering if the end users only uh, get the event alerts, or are they also uh, are they also able to query the HBase archive? And if so, how do you provide that service? Yeah, so they they can do both. Uh, they receive in real time, and they can go back to the archive. Maybe I can show. Um, yeah, that's challenging to, uh, so the, the, <clears throat> the real time is easy because we, they can use their favorite tool. For HBase, of course, we had to provide an uh, API for them. Um, I would say scientific community is more SQL-like things. Uh, so when we provide with them something on HBase, they say, oh, what's this syntax, what's this? Um, so we provide on top of the API a lot of abstraction layer so that they can formulate their query in, uh, let's say, meta language that they understand. And then we uh, interpret that into HBase uh, query. One of the difficulties with HBase, if you don't know HBase in, HBase in, in a nutshell, uh, <coughs> tables, they have only a single uh, raw key. So you can index only on a single thing. The problem is queries that people formulate, they are very rich, okay? Uh, so you can, for, for example, your key can be, I don't know, partition my data on space, but if you formulate the query on time, <laughs> it will just take forever. So we had to use, uh, let's say, clever techniques in EdgeBase to enable queries as rich as possible, and I would be happy in the another talk to <laughs> explain you all the clever things or stupid things we've done with HBase. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the talk. It was very, very interesting. Y you were just a second ago talking about the longevity of the people contributing to maintaining this pipeline. Um, and I saw you have the CD repo for this on your GitHub. Um, and I was wondering, are you like trying to solicit external contributions to help maintain it or from the other institutions using the data? Or are you thinking that you'll just make this public but really you guys will be the ones mostly controlling the direction of the platform rather than of the subcomponents that go into it? That's a good question. I, I don't think I have a final answer. Maybe uh, Fabrice will add some word on that. So all the code is open source, uh, infrastructure and uh, science. Um, usually people, <clears throat> when they come, they, they will just open a pull request, for example, hey, I have this idea. Um, the difficulty is often they don't know how to formulate or how to integrate their piece of code into the thing. So we have a, a lot of tutorials, how-tos, etc., to just explain, um, uh, and, and a lot of templates as well to explain them how it should be done. Um, but eventually, um, it rarely works the first time. <laughs> Uh, so we spend a lot of time trying to accompany them, uh, work with them. So we have um, a dedicated team, basically, that spend time in 
with the, with the scientists and they sit down and they try, we try first to work out the details, so what are you trying to do, then the requirements in terms of computing, for example, in terms of um, dependencies, so do you need deep learning, do you need machine learning, or a very simple thing, that, that would be very different at the end. Um, and typically after a month or two, the, we can hand off everything to the science team because they learn everything they need to learn and then they can live on their own and they can contribute uh, without our assistance uh, after. But yes, it, typically it doesn't work the first time, it takes a few months and then... Uh, uh, yes, I will, I will talk about the technical side also for contributing. So look, um, on the technical side, there is two uh, open source tools, this one, K-Test Toolbox. And so we are happy to embed con new contributors, it's simple code, so if you do a pull request, of course, we're happy to integrate it. And uh, new ideas are welcome, because I think this covers large use cases for people who use Kubernetes. And so, yes, we are happy to uh, embed new features in the tool and make it uh, uh, to have uh, more feature. And also, so this one is think dedicated, so I don't think it will interest so the people, maybe people who use Spark, maybe. And Sux also is interesting for CI, because you see, I work on CI systems since now seven years, and these two tools, yes, I think they are useful, because most of the time you fix it with shell script, and you have this complex shell script, you need to move on all your CI platform, how to version it, how to deploy it. And these tools are easy to deploy, easy to version, and can provide a good feature. And yes, pull requests are welcome. So if you want to contribute, we would be happy to embed you in, the, in this project. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for sharing this. Um, I was wondering, maybe, um, what, what what was the architectural choice for cho uh, choosing uh, for HBase together with Apache Spark and um, where because uh, there's also Apache Flink? Um, I was just wondering if there were uh, features within Apache Flink which could potentially replace both of HBase and uh, Apache Spark. Thank you for the question. Um, it's always difficult to make a choice at some point. Uh, concerning Spark is we had, um, we had a proof of concept at that time back in 2019 that was working with Spark. So definitely that was the technology we wanted to use. And we are 2024 and we are still happy with Spark. So definitely uh, it's part of the stack and it, it won't be removed. Edgebase, <coughs> I hate Edgebase. Just hate it. It, it, it gives me headaches every day. But the team is small. Uh, the team of engineers around us is, is small. And at that time, we had an engineer working with the CERN, so the, the, the high energy physics uh, collider uh, lab in, in Geneva. And they had a huge expertise in edge base. And we didn't know what to choose at that time. There was many, many different options. But we had this person with knowledge on this and we made this choice i'm still not sure if it's the right choice now or if we, or if back in 2019 would have been better to take some training on something else and, and so yeah um you mentioned a few, a few names yes definitely we are looking around the stack of the project is not grave in stone, so we are set to run until 2035 because the observatory will run until 2035. But every six months, basically, we reconsider every piece of the, of the stack and start to think, well, in one, two, three years, will it still be there? And do, you, do we need some, to, to change something, uh, take training? So, yeah, that's, that's okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yes, in addition, I would say that the, our goal is to deliver a service to astronomers and not, not to, we are not stick to some, some technologies. So if your technologies come, which is better than the one we use now, and it gets mature, of course we will switch. But that now this works well. We'll switch if, you have time, if we have time and manpower to switch. <laughs> and human power, sorry. <laughs> it's easy to get locked. <laughs> You're hungry. <laughs> Follow-up question towards uh, HBase. I was wondering, how do you host this uh, service? 
Is it co-located to the Kubernetes cluster? Is it running on VMs? Um, are you using any third party that helps you setting this up? Because from experience, I know hosting HBase, actually having a production, it's not a nice thing. Um, no, it simple. isn't. <laughs> and it's usually very costly as well on the operations side, but also on the support side. So I was wondering how that looks like on your side. So now our deployment is bare metal. So we don't use Kubernetes for that. So we have HDFS cluster, basically. And we deploy HBase, I would say, manually, almost manually. I mean, it's Terraform and, uh, and of course, all those things. That helps. But yes, this is definitely one of the weakness. Uh, so most of the time it fails. There is some problem with a huge shuffle that suddenly Edgebase decided to trigger and we don't know what and everything's parallelized for hours. Uh, so yeah, no, that could be easier. Definitely a lot easier. Also, yes, for uh, databases, um, no, we don't run Edgebase in Kubernetes, but databases are coming more and more uh, up to um, more and more, running more and more well in Kubernetes. So when we will move the database to Kubernetes, we will investigate if we switch or if we run hash based. I don't know if uh, the, um, this stack is not is working well in Kubernetes now. Seems uh, maybe there is some other technology, but databases run pretty well now in Kubernetes thanks to operator. So we need to study that. Thank you very much. I think time's is over. I see a zero, zero, zero. <laughs> bon appétit. <laughs> <laughs>